afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, Senior Wealth Manager at Barometer Capital, and we welcome you so warmly to another Barometer Readings webcast. Joining me today is our Chief Investment Officer, David Burrows, who will be pleased to provide a macro overview and, of course, at the tail end of the conversation, be happy to address your questions. So don't be shy. You can hit us up on the Q&A or the chat via Zoom. And with that, I turn the conversation over to the one and only David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Thanks, Pamela. I hope wherever you guys are, it's uh, not snowing as hard as it is right here. Downtown Toronto, I'm looking out my window from our, our office, and it's a bit of a whiteout. So it might be a bit of a long ride home tonight. Yes. Uh, but uh, but anyway, hopefully some folks are, are sitting in some warm weather. Um, uh, here we are now uh, into the third week of January. Uh, markets uh, started a little bit wobbly at the beginning of the month. Uh, they firmed up over the last week. Most importantly, the S&P made a new high post the rollover in December of 2021. I think that's really important. NASDAQ made a new all-time high. Uh, and, uh, you know, some interesting things in market internal. So we have lots to talk about. Uh, so why don't we just sort of start from the top uh, because, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of time over the last 18 months talking about, you know, getting to the other side of the valley uh, to the point where the market makes a new high, because that tends to mean you've begun a new uh, new bull market. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit. So just to start off, you know, the backdrop continues to be as it has been since 2013, that we're in a structural bull market for stocks. This is the U.S. stock market where we exceeded the high from the market peak in 2000 and took, <clears throat> excuse me, took 13 years uh, and two very severe bear markets to wash out the over ownership that came in the 80s and 90s. Uh, 80s and 90s lasted 19 years. Uh, there were some, you know, big declines along the way, certainly the crash of 1987, the recession 1990-91, which on the chart looks like a bit of a blip, but certainly was a painful period for real estate investors. Um, you had a, a difficult period in 1998, uh, the Asian currency crisis. But ultimately, it was like four steps forward, one step back. Secular bear markets take a long time to unfold. They're really frustrating because you have to be very tactical. You know, it's really more of a trader's market. And frankly, during those periods, people look for more certainty. Yield becomes a bigger source of return. But as we're speaking here, we close today at uh, 4860 on the S&P. We're up about 1.9% on the month now. Uh, and as you can see, we've exceeded the high from the beginning of the bear market that was 25 months ago. So that's a long drawn out process. Um, so, uh, you know, so here we are, uh, s and is making a new all time high. Uh, and I think that that's important. We've said sort of over the last two years, when you make a new high after a cyclical bear market, especially if you've held above the rising 200 week moving average, you tend to be in the next cyclical bull market. Market is looking beyond whatever it is that has bothered, been bothering the market, looking at the next business cycle. My guess is this is pointing more toward a soft landing than a hard landing. Uh, and when we look at the market internals and some of the groups that have been leading, as it has been all year long, more economically sensitive groups, as opposed to the defensive groups that people would go hide in you know, if there really was going to be a hard landing. So I think that that's important. When we look at the shorter term picture, uh, you can see here we are uh, 48, 4, 485 on the spider, which is the S&P 500 ETF. Again, above the highs from the end of 2021. You know, long way from the low that we put in in October of 2022. And from that point, we've seen a series of higher lows. We got one more big shake from August through the end of October, a little over 10% decline, which reversed. And right around that time, we saw the breadth indicators that we track, where the, we're tracking the percent of stocks within the market that are in long-term uptrends, really start to expand. March was the first and most important point as we exited above this downtrend. It's also the point where more groups started to participate other than the top seven stocks in the NASDAQ. And from that time, you know, markets have been working their way higher. This is a point and figure chart of the S&P 500. This is the low in October. 
axes means price is rising, O's means it's falling. And what we like to see on every chart is higher highs and higher lows. And clearly that's the case now. <clears throat> you know, I don't want to get ahead of myself, uh, but the point and figure target based off this beginning of an uptrend uh, would be somewhere around 6,000 on the S&P 500. So we're at 48.50 now. Doesn't mean it's going to be in a straight line, that's for sure. But my guess is we have uh, we have higher targets having made new highs. Um, just historically speaking, uh, when the market has had a very difficult time, you know, the decline, the length of the bear markets in 1950, since 1950, length of time to get to the lows. In this case, it was about 9.3 months. It was about a 25% decline. Um, <clears throat> and then once uh, we eventually moved above the previous bull market peak, in this case, it was 15 months. We'll see what happens. But, you know, when we look out over the number of times that it was a, a good distance between the old high and then the first new high, you know, overwhelmingly a year out, over 90% of the cases market was higher, an average of 10.5%. Now that includes the exception, which was 2007, just going into the financial crisis. It had taken 55 months to make the new high. It's a really different picture. Uh, we're talking about 15 months to make a new high. So this was happened, in fact, in the middle of a secular bear market. Uh, and so a different, different example. So interesting statistics, we certainly don't make decisions based on them, but we like to know what the backdrop is. <clears throat> we also know that often once uh, we uh, get through a tightening cycle, we start to see expanding multiples. Now, in a secular bear market, we had a secular bear market from 2000 to 2014. You had a tightening cycle that led into a big economic problem and the mess and P multiple forward price earnings multiple collapsed over the next three years. That's a financial crisis. You had a tightening cycle in 2005 and six and coming out again, we headed into the financial crisis, PE multiples contracted. But you're in, when you're in a structural bull market, it tends to be after a tightening cycle, you see PEs expand, 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 expand. And we certainly did after the tightening cycle in 2015-16, we expanded nicely and we started to see PEs expand. Now we're starting from a higher level, but doesn't mean that PEs can't go higher. It's just something to keep in mind. Now we know US stocks have really outperformed the rest of the world. We've talked a little bit about the fact that we've seen other markets around the world start to participate. You know, Canada is one of them really wobbled through the course of the last year. This is the decline through 2022. It did make higher lows, but then this whoosh lower into the end of October, this made it very difficult to be invested in our local market. But even that, you know, has resolved to the upside since the end of October, a uh, big rally up into the highs here, and then we break out. And if we look at it on a bigger picture, you know, this is very substantial, long bear market broken out, consolidates and, and now moving higher. During that time, though, Canadians and global investors threw the towel in on Canadian equities. Um, this is the net record outflows from Canadian equities. So you can see positioning in Canadian equities is about as low as it has been since the financial crisis. So people certainly have made a bet that Canada is going to have a difficult time. We'll see. Chart looks otherwise. Uh, but uh, but uh, certainly the positioning has been very cautious and the PE in Canada, you know, is right within the range that it's been in going back to 2000. You know, really, it's actually below the 50 percent line. And so the, the market is not overly expensive. Looking outside of Canada, uh, Nikkei continues just to power ahead. These are monthly bars. It's been a wonderful month for the Japanese stock market. We've seen India behaving particularly well. All of these you can see have moved out of very long periods where there was no performance, broke, broken out a Fed tightening cycle and really a, a sharp move higher. So these markets are acting well. Mexico is another one. It's pulled back a little bit over the last four weeks, but you know, just sort of coming back into the rising moving averages that would show us we've made a significant turn in these markets. 
So global markets inexpensive relative to US stock markets, which are not inexpensive, but certainly the multiple is rising. Global, mar global earnings multiples uh, minus the U.S. multiple shows just how inexpensive global stocks are relative to U.S. equities. Now, I don't want to minimize the fact that the U.S. market has a substantial weighting in large cap tech, and there are some great companies addressing big, big markets like AI, but it also means <clears throat> that there might be some good value outside of the U.S. China, we continue to be cautious on. It's continued really to be a difficult market. Uh, we don't have any exposure here. Relative strength versus the S&P has just continued to collapse. Tons of global money leaving China. You know, that's the first <clears throat> quarterly outflow of capital going back to the year 2000. And you can see, if you look at the uh, FXI, which is the Hong Kong market, I mean, this is trading at levels it hasn't seen since 2007 and it's trading right at the bottom of the band as opposed to the other global markets we've looked at, which have resolved bear markets and come out the top. From a bond, uh, uh, from a bond perspective, the asset class you know, continues to look difficult. This is rising rates since uh, the middle of 2020. We look at it uh, 1981 through 2022. So 40 years of declining rates, sorry, 2020. We exceeded the highs and we've been making higher highs and higher lows since still not overly excited about having money in U.S. Treasury bonds, Canadian bonds or any sovereign bonds. In fact, the drawdown continues. <clears throat> it's been 41 months. We're still way off the highs. Bonds negative on the year, really just from March of last year to the end of the year, while assets rallied up about 2%. So if we look at dividend paying, sorry, dividend growth stocks versus the aggregate bond index, you know, it continues to show strength, showed strength from the point where rates started to rise until the point we went into the market correction. This is the course of the market correction and we've been making higher lows and higher highs since then. So dividend growth would be a preferred area. Since the middle of March, uh, we're really happy kind of with the way that the strategies are working. Uh, our equity strategy up about 17 versus the TSX up about 11, uh, equal weight up about 15. This is up about another three and a half or four percent to start the year. Uh, our income portfolio up 11.9 percent to the end of the year, again up about another two and a half percent to start this year. Bonds actually have had a negative start to the year, uh, so in general we're we're pretty pleased with with the positioning. So. As we, as we have pointed out lots of times, when rates started to rise in the early 1950s, bonds were not the place to be. Long-term U.S. government bonds from 1951 to 1966, while rates were rising, gave a 1.6% return, roughly equal to inflation. When I got in the investment business in the mid-1980s, we knew and we were taught you buy equities to offset the impact of inflation because corporations have the ability to raise price. And if you're a company that generates excess cash and you need to operate the business and you're willing to pay a rising stream of dividends to shareholders, that's another way to offset uh, inflation. So dividend growth stocks through the 50s and 60s did remarkably well. And we're seeing that you know, early stages in this market we're talking about now. Commodities, commodities reversed their bear market in 2020. They went through a, a consolidation, broke out in the late summer, sorry, October, November. We pulled back a little bit to start the year. Again, very constructive, all of the moving averages moving higher. We're trading above all of the moving averages. My guess is we see this uh, start to perform a little better. There was some gaps that were left behind uh, in midway through December when the market really took off. And the market's been coming back and filling those in. But the positioning is still very light in commodities in general. So look, there's a lot of places that we could be focusing right now. Um, broad number of sectors, broad number of global markets. We don't have to be everywhere. Our job is to focus on market leadership. And market leaders might be specific geographic regions, might be specific sectors. It might be specific themes. 
might be specific types of companies like large companies versus small companies or growth companies versus value companies. Our job is to identify the strength and be focused there. Typically, when you exit a long bear market, the things that are performing well or have outperformed the market to that point tend to continue to do pretty well. If there's a lack of leadership or deterioration in breadth as we measure it, you know, you have to be willing to have money on the sidelines. No, that's not the case now. We're pretty fully invested, but this is a tactical approach. We aren't getting paid to be invested. We're getting paid to identify where to focus. In our conversations we've been having with clients, while we're seeing strength in a number of different areas, the key changes that we have been encouraging is to increase global exposure, which we're doing through having repurposed a, uh, an equity portfolio, the Barometer Equity Fund, to a pure global portfolio, XUS. We've been encouraging for income investors or cores of, in, of, of portfolios to shift from a balanced oriented portfolio that includes fixed income to a more dividend growth focused, which we're focused on in our tactical income portfolio. And we are asking people not to be shy about having equity exposure because once you've been through a two year bear market and you make an exit, you wanna be able to take advantage of what's coming next. When we look at our work, our top down work has been generally improving. We look at about 300 universes of security, sectors, themes, geographic regions, and try to identify those that are seeing a net inflow of capital. Where is the money getting put to work? We take a bottom up approach by taking a broad universe of companies and putting them through some tasks, looking at income statement and balance sheet, looking for things that are good to begin with, but are getting better, where we can see signs that something's accelerating in the business. And where we can find themes that are seeing net inflows and companies within those themes that meet the tests, this is where our portfolio should live. We only need 20 to 30 names in a portfolio if they are all meeting these tests. You don't have to be a rule. We don't want to look like an index. 70% of return comes from getting to the right neighborhood. 30% of return comes from finding securities to express your view. From a top-down perspective, we're always looking for groups where percent of stocks performing well is expanding, meaning the buying is spreading to more and more securities. That's a healthy market. When breadth is deteriorating, it tells us we should be a little bit more cautious, maybe raise a little bit of cash, stop putting new money to work, make sure our stop losses that we have on all of the securities are a little bit tighter. It doesn't mean we're going to go sell a bunch of stuff, but if it starts hitting our stops, our cash position will rise. And through the course of a deteriorating market, it tends to be that we can play defense. That's really not where we are right now. We're more in this camp where we're seeing expanding breadth. So let's talk a little bit about this. Um, this is uh, where we were uh, a week ago, uh, sorry, two weeks ago, percent of stocks with the 50 day had started to pull back, percent of stocks above with positive weekly momentum had started to pull back, percent of stocks making new lows, percent of stocks above the 150 day moving average saw some weakness. This past week, we saw the percent of stocks trading above their 50 day moving average start to expand again, this turned back green. Percent of stocks with positive weekly momentum got all the way down to 8% and reversed higher. So these both have turned green and we saw net improvement across the globe. Let's talk about that a little bit. First of all, <clears throat> last week, NASDAQ had seen breadth pull back or the percent of stocks in uptrend from 86% to 74. We'd maintained above this 70% line, which means 70% of stocks are performing well. This week, as the market strengthened, we saw a reversal in breadth, green light. In the NYSE, as I mentioned, the percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average had pulled back at the beginning of the year after a very sharp rally through November, December. That reversed back green early uh, at the end of last week. When we look at the percent of stocks globally across the globe that are in uptrends, we showed last week a very significant high where we exceeded the highs from 2022 in August, sorry, in April, August, February of 23, July of 23, 
to make a new high. Breadth globally continues to be very strong. When we look at Asia Pacific, which includes, you know, India and Japan, same thing. We took out the highs of the last three years and we're sitting basically right at the high. The chart level's 48%. So 48% of stocks and uptrends, that means one and two, but we're sitting right at the high chart point. So while the U.S. corrected a little bit in the first two weeks of January, now showing strength again, no wobble coming from Asia Pacific. The one obvious area that has been difficult has been Shanghai. We've got no exposure. But interestingly, off the point and figure targets, 2940 was the downward objective. It's now exceeded that downward target. So it may be running its course. If I look at the FXI ETF, which measures Hong Kong stocks, target was $21. Well, $21 is where it is. When we look at breadth for the Chinese market, we are at the point where only 16% of stocks are in uptrends. If I go back over a decade, somewhere between 10 and 20% is where it tends to bottom. Uh, when we look at the percent of stocks trading above the 50-day moving average in Shanghai, 8%. So an exceedingly narrow market. We'll watch to see if there's any significant shift there. But as I mentioned, flows have been out of China. Lots of difficulty there. We we don't try and pick bottoms. We want to see significant change before we'd be putting any money to work. Let's talk about sector leadership. So uh, from the lows in December of 22, the first quarter was dominated by a sharp rally in tech. And since then, we've seen a series of higher highs and higher lows. And I guess I'd point out that as of today, the XLK, which is the ETF that owns large cap technology stocks, made a new high and a new relative high versus the S&P 500. So that's positive. Apple's been a bit sloppy, but the rest of the group's acting well. When we look at bullish percent or the percent of stocks in the semiconductor sector performing well, pulled back a little bit in the first week of January, but powered right back again this week. So 60% of stocks in the semiconductor sector are doing well, but there are some real stars, right? NVIDIA continues to be the star here. Trading better than 98% of companies in the S&P 500 just made a new five-year high and not showing any sign of weakening. Broadcom, which is our other large semiconductor weight, trading better than 96% of companies in the S&P. Again, as of yesterday, made a new all-time high down a SNP today and not showing any weakness as the semiconductor group pulled back. We mentioned over the last few weeks that cybersecurity continues to lead the market, make new relative strength highs here. <clears throat> Palo Alto Networks would be our key position We've looked at adding a position in CrowdStrike, not there yet, uh, and um, and Microsoft in the cloud and AI, again, acting you know really constructively. So there's no surprise here. This is a group that's been working all year long. Relative strength you know, has been very good relative to the rest of the market. They're important companies in the index and we wanna be there. A um, couple, of, couple of names we haven't talked about. ServiceNow. Uh, ServiceNow is a company that uh, is effectively a platform for scheduling uh, service work, especially service bureaus for technology for companies. Um, it's uh, it's continued to grow really, really nicely. They report their earnings tomorrow. We expect they report pretty good numbers, trading better than 94% of companies in the S&P. If anything, maybe a little bit extended above the moving averages, uh, but this is a, you know clearly a leading stock. So moving beyond tech, Remember, we want risk reward on our side. When I say that, we want groups that have underwhelmed over a long period of time, have become underowned by investors, are trading at reasonable prices, in many cases have gone through lots of restructuring to set the businesses up for the next cycle. And I think financials are an important group here. Now, the short term picture. The financial sector made a new high in 2021 in that last run-up before the correction. Corrected through the course of 2022 and 23, and now broken out of that consolidation. The big picture, 
a bear market from 2007 through 2020. That's a long bear market. It's a lot like what's happened in the stock market at various points in time. And after the restructuring that's taken place, I think it's very interesting that we're making new highs and we're coming out beyond this consolidation that took place while the Fed was raising rates. So we've seen a lot of the technical oscillators start to improve. We've talked, of course, about insurance over the last year. The insurance sector made its first new high, all-time high, in March of 2022 against a bear market in the stock market. Very quickly resolved again and made another new high at the beginning of 2023. And today is sitting about 19% above the highs it was at in December of 2021 as the market was making its high. This is a leadership group. Now, it may be you've looked at your statement that you get from your insurance company and realize your premiums are going up. And that's certainly the case. Pricing has been hard, but they're also making great returns on their investment portfolios. This is a group that continues to act well. We've talked about Fairfax. We've talked about Berkshire Hathaway. <clears throat> and we've talked about others that are in the portfolio currently. The capital markets banks have seen improving relative strength since May uh, of 2020. Uh, May of 2023, trading better than 80% of companies in the S&P. And you can see like a lot of stocks that really gapped higher in the middle of uh, beginning of December, pulled back and filled that gap. Very often when a gap is left behind in the chart, it's uncanny how often it will come back and fill it for being overbought before it reverses higher. And over the last few days, <clears throat> capital markets, banks turning higher. Industrials. Industrials, this is the, the longer term picture, uh, made a high in, uh, in 2021, exceeded the highs briefly in September before the October pullback, and now gone on to make new all-time highs. This is a group that includes the transports. It includes <clears throat> heavy equipment. Uh, this is Howmet, which is one of our big defense positions, making new relative and absolute highs. Eaton Corp, which we talked about last week in the power management business, and Cargo Jet, which is one of our newer positions, uh, had an interesting investor day this week. Looks as though lots of opportunity for upside in earnings over the next year. This has had a great run since the market lows in October. So big picture again. If we compare how transports are doing relative to utilities, it's kind of like saying how are the offensive or highly economically sensitive sectors behaving relative to defensive sectors. And so we can see that really since September of 22, we've been seeing higher highs and higher lows in the offense part of the market versus defense. And just recently this month, making a new relative high to before the sell-off that took place in 2022. So again, this is one of those things that makes me think it's an important clue coming from the market. For those that think that there's a hard landing in the economy, this would make no sense. Now, generally, the market ultimately gets it right. So I think this is an important clue to say, okay, offensive companies or more economically sensitive companies continue to outperform, and they have done that all year long. Materials. Materials after consolidating during the Fed's tightening cycle and holding up actually remarkably well, considering the concerns about the economy, broke out of their range and over the last four weeks came back and tested the top end of the range this week, reversing higher. Led, of course, by uranium. We've talked about that. This is the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. This is the shares of Cameco, which have been a significant position in the portfolios. But we're also seeing strength in metals and miners, foreign mining in the mid caps, is a copper company. Again, look back, this is 1999 through 2021. This is a company that's putting a copper mine into production, uh, acting exceedingly well. But I think that really just shows what may be happening here. We're watching tech resources as a large cap. It's taking some time to get going, certainly. But my guess is, again, when you've got a long bear market that you're exiting, lots of room to the upside. Energy, a lot like uh, we're seeing in materials a little bit more sort of consolidation. 
this long sideways period where the market made no progress is sort of like a, a spring coiling. And ultimately, my guess is we see this move higher. But as you know, we took our weight down in energy to about 6% until we start to see it happen. If I was looking for a tell, I'd look for Canadian natural resources to get going. It certainly broke out of its base <clears throat> a couple of years ago uh, and is trading above the most recent support. Uh, this is a company that has a great dividend, tons of free cash flow generation, you know, years and years of, of, uh, of reserves and the, the new pipeline capacity coming to market over the next year is going to be a game changer here. So this could be a really great dividend growth stock. Pharmaceuticals continue to act pretty well. Eli Lilly and the GLP-1 drugs, again, made a new, <clears throat> made a new high this week. Vertex Pharmaceuticals and cystic fibrosis made a new high this week. Those are our two key uh, uh, pharmaceutical positions. Healthcare, not a big weight for us because devices and managed healthcare are not pre performing particularly well, but these are sort of special situations. So I'm gonna keep going back and testing to say, are the defensive parts of the market perking up, which would tell us that maybe there is a softer economy coming. And look at this in blue, relative strength, or the relative performance of utilities versus the rest of the market just continues to underwhelm. Made a new relative strength low today. And after rallying to $66 toward uh, the end of December, back here 10% lower, really not showing any sustainable strength. A lot like what's happening in the bond market. This is the aggregate bond ETF, which is an ETF that owns various issuers and various maturities of various credit quality in the US, continued relative underperformance of bonds. So what does that mean? When we put it all together, it continues to mean that we have a real barbell approach in these portfolios. We're very skewed toward financials, now 25% of overall firm assets. That includes insurance companies, large banks like JP Morgan, uh, like, uh, like uh, Royal Bank, CIBC. Um, we have a significant weight in tech, although we've taken that down relative to the market because we're seeing other sectors with, we think, very, very good risk reward. An overweight position in industrials, uh, and uh, and uh, an overweight position in energy versus U.S. markets and underweight versus Canadian markets. Corporate bonds continue to be a small position, about 7%, uh, and materials and overweight at 8%. These are all economically sensitive groups. At the other end of the spectrum, utilities, real estate, cash, communication services, telecom, small parts of the portfolio. We have an underweight position in the consumer because we think if interest rates are going to squeeze anybody, it's the consumer. Um, so we continue to be skewed toward the things that do well in a reflating economy. So this is a different look at a similar statistic we looked at earlier on. When the market has taken a while to make a new all-time high, when we go out 12 months, you know, in a very high percentage a uh, set of circumstances, market is strong. There's a ton of cash out there in the hands of corporations who can buy back shares or in the hands of investors who have been sitting waiting for the market to have another major decline if we were to have a hard landing. Seasonally, we know January, February, March, April, and May are important months for inflows into retirement accounts, both in Canada and the U.S., we know that credit spreads continue to narrow, meaning that bond investors are comfortable with credit risk. And the market's assessment of likelihood of volatility, or the VIX, is very suppressed. The best bull markets in history happened when volatility was at low levels. And we certainly are there now. So this can change. We watch the market internals. But I would say it's time to, you know, be a little bit happy that we're at a point where the market's making its first new all-time high since December of 21. This gives us more confidence that we are into the next economic cycle and that we're into the next cyclical bull market. 
This causes us to want to look at portfolios and say, do we have enough equity exposure? You know, should we be shifting money from portfolios that have to own bonds like balanced portfolios to come to portfolios that are more dividend growth focused? And should we have a portfolio position in global equities because we're seeing global stocks do well for the first time in 15 years and it's an opportunity to diversify? Lots of things to think about. So if things get more difficult, we certainly will play defense. Things don't go in a straight line. Uh, we're in an election year. It tends to be that after January and February, markets do better through the course of the year. Uh, virtually every election year since 1960 has been re-election year has been positive, especially when there's an incumbent. Um, so with that, Pamela, if there's any questions, certainly I can answer them. Uh, but uh, I think that we just want to keep Bumping the ball ahead, we're very happy with the positioning in the portfolios. Thanks so much, David. We have actually a very active Q&A today. So um, let's start with uh, this first question. An, an anonymous attendee has asked, uh, David, I read an interesting article today that noted increasing global geopolitical tensions are becoming a new reality for markets. How does a local Canadian fund manager like yourself ensure that they understand and appreciate this kind of risk? So, so let's just tear that apart a little bit. Remember that markets are a big machine. They're made up of a thousand moving parts. There's a lot of things that impact markets. Almost none of them come out of nowhere. So uh, I think that in the last number of years, Investors have worked hard at peeking around corners to see what scary thing might be coming next. I don't think that geopolitical risk, you know, with China and Taiwan or uh, the Russians in Ukraine uh, or the issues that are taking place in Israel are something brand new. Generally, conflict is somewhat anticipated uh, and digested by markets beforehand historically during wars, actually markets go up. We've worried about the Fed tightening cycle now for 18 months. We've worried about recession. Markets have been discounting concerns all the way through, you know, this recent period. You know, this is the S&P starting to worry in December of 21. And here we are now making new all-time highs. I can tell you, if you wait until the moment there's nothing to worry about, you will be making investments at exactly the wrong time. So I really strongly believe that we have to look at a broad spectrum of factors and we have to look at what's happening internally in the market. Right? If it's offensively led sectors that are leading the market at a time when everybody's worried, you should maybe ask yourself why? Like, what is it that I could be missing? Is it possible the economy is stronger than we think? Now, I worry about governments, but I'm buying companies, right? The companies that we buy globally aren't specific to one local market. They're global leaders. Now, it happens to be that globally, financial services companies are doing well for the first time since 2007. And when we look at the sector makeup of most global markets, more so even than in the US, financials tend to be by far the biggest weighted part of the market. Also, industrials tend to be very significant in global markets. And, you know, in industrials, there's a lot of defense companies and companies that build heavy equipment. We've got reshoring of manufacturing going on in the US as they're trying to make the supply chains more resilient. We've seen an explosion in manufacturing construction in the US, creating demand for materials and engineering and heavy equipment. So it's not lost on me that there's geopolitical risk. You know, you'd have to be living under a rock not to assess the fact that there are risks. And look at the market's been wrestling with this, this for the last, you know, 25 months. So during this period, there's a lot of companies that have continued to grow their earnings really well. 
And there's a lot of companies that have made progress against their competitors. There's lots of companies that have done poorly. We only need 20 to 30 in a portfolio to make a success. So um, I, I think it's really important. I'm a macro guy. My job is to look at the very big picture, not to be so focused on Canada or the US or a specific industry. You know, our mandates at Barometer are very broad. We have an ability to go anywhere. We don't have to be in any particular sector. If something isn't behaving well, we can avoid it. But I would say in the course of my career, if I look at the setup that I see today in some of those sectors that we've talked about that have gone 10, 15, 20 years without performing that have wakened up, I think there's a real opportunity and it's not for three months, it's for like the next five or 10 years. And so, you know, look, you just can't wait until you get an all clear sign. You know, from March of this past year, we've had a really good lift in the portfolios. I know there are people that have been waiting to see the market make a new high to say, okay, maybe it is, there is a, a cycle beyond, you know, the one we've been going through. But, you know, I, I think that it has just continued to galvanize the case that the economy is probably not headed for a hard landing. And if, if those indicators start to shift, I'm certainly happy to change position. We're not going to go down with the ship. Uh, but uh, at this point, I think it's it's getting clearer that we are looking beyond a global tightening cycle. Sorry, long-winded answer. Thanks so much, Dave. The next question we've received is from Alejandro. He says, good afternoon, David. Do you see recovery in the self-driving electric car market after the industry fell earlier this month? Yeah, you know, so um, it's a it's a great question. Um, it's had a difficult go. Uh, I'll be honest. Uh, DRIV is uh, an ETF that has a lot of the autonomous uh, car companies in it. Um, I am short the DRIV in our macro portfolio. Uh, it's not to say that there isn't lots of, <coughs> excuse me, lots of opportunity. It's just technically not set up very well. You know, it, wait and see. I mean, my first my first thing would be to see uh, this ETF get sort of above the 200 and 150 day moving average as it sits right now. We're below the 50 day, below the 200, below the 150, both below both the 21 day and the eight day moving average. You know, it doesn't look so good. Um, and I think, you know, importantly, you have to look at Tesla. Uh, Tesla's, you know, having a sloppy period here. Um, if we look at a little longer term picture, we made highs back here in November of 21, and we've made a series of lower highs since. Again, I think that there's other things to do. Sometimes things get crowded and overdone. Um, my guess is technically the next level of support would be at this trend line uh, on Tesla, which is sort of $180, $183. My guess is it, it could well go there. Or if it exceeded the highs at uh, 208, that, sorry, 268, that would be interesting also. Uh, I'd want to see one of those two things happen first. And that's probably a proxy for the group. Thanks so much, David. The next question is from Larry. He asks, uh, David, would you favor insurers over the banks short to midterm? Yeah, you know, um, the, the, the insurers have led off the lows. And a lot of it had to do with the pricing power they've had in their premiums. You know, if, if you look at your auto insurance, it probably went up 20 or 25 percent this year, which is, you know, a lot. At the same time, cost of repairing cars seems to be coming off the boil. Um, but, you know, auto theft is a big deal. I know here in Canada, auto theft is up about 100 percent since the early part of 2022. So, you know, lots of costs associated with that. Um, you know, we like both. Um uh, we like banks like JP Morgan, where they, you know, just spending an enormous amount of money on technology, putting a moat around their business. They've been really, really effective at managing risks. Uh, and I think that that looks quite good. You know, when I, when I put up the XLF, uh, let's see if I can share it. So I put up the long-term picture of the XLF. That's that's insurance, it's banks, it's, you know, uh, fintech and so on. If we put up the KBE, which is the, you know, large cap banks, 
you know, the decline began really in May of 2007, a year before the financial crisis got going. Um, and it broke out, but, you know, it's, it's retraced a fair bit. Uh, it's trying to get going. I look at that and I compare that to JP Morgan. <laughs> you know, JP Morgan made its first new high in 2013. That's the leader, right? And here we are trading basically at a 52 week high, very different than the group. So this is a group with haves and have nots. Um, and uh, I think you have to pick your spots. Uh, there's opportunities here, but companies like Fairfax Financial here in, in, in Canada, which is like a mini, uh, a mini Berkshire Hathaway. You know, this has been rallying sharply since December of 2020 and really has not taken a breath. Uh, progressive in the U.S., you know, you know, how can you fight that? Uh, it's it's auto insurance, obviously. Berkshire Hathaway, you know, is acting pretty well, uh, and we own some. Um, it's not quite as strong as as uh, as uh, Fairfax, but you know, it's a it's a big big company and a big big ship. I, I guess if I had to if I had to pick one for consistency, insurance probably looks the best. Thanks so much, David. Um, really quickly, your thoughts on the pot potash sector. Any comments there? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. I've been looking at that. Um, seasonally, it's a time when you start to look at the group. Um, but really, it's it's been very, very weak and very disappointing. You know, crop prices have been have been relatively low. Wheat prices, soybeans uh, and uh, and corn have really come down a lot over the course of the last number of months. Um, I, I think we need to see some shift here before before we would put new money to work. And the last question of the day is on international diversification in 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 certain portfolios. Um, this question is asking how much international diversification do you recommend in the current environment? What are we doing with our clients, Dave? Yeah, well, I'll tell you. So um, as I mentioned, we've we've talked over the course of the last, I don't know, it's got to be eight months or nine months about the, what's emerging in countries like Japan and India and now Latin America, you know, Mexico, even in some cases, some of the European markets. And they are posing a credible uh, uh, alternative diversifier to U.S. stocks. I'm not saying that U.S. stocks can't continue to power along. They've been leadership all the way along. But the performance gap between the U.S. and the rest of the world and the valuation gap is really at an extreme. So that's why we took, we took our public mutual fund, which is the barometer discipline leadership equity fund, and converted it to a global uh, fund, XUS, at 60 positions. Uh, it is, uh, we take the global universe and screen for quality to take advantage of the quality premium that's available. 30, 30 names are large cap names that have very strong relative strength or leadership characteristics from that high quality list. And 30 names are more value oriented uh, companies that we're putting on with a three year time horizon. Um, they're, you know, well recognized names. If you're a global investor, uh, big companies, but the sector weights are very much like the MSCI XUS index. And, and that's something that we're encouraging people to look at as a portion of their portfolio. Our global macro portfolio, of course, has exposure already to Latin America and Japan and, 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 uh, and Mexico, as well as some of the commodities. But I think it's time. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, we know that by the time you come to an end of a secular bear market, whether it's U.S. stocks or otherwise, people hate the asset class. It's under-owned. It's generally inexpensive. Uh, and the risk levels are generally pretty low. So uh, we think it plays well over the next three to four years. Great. Thanks so much, David. That concludes the questions that we've received this afternoon. And of course, if anyone has questions that they haven't uh, decided to post here but are thinking about it, they can always reach out to David. He's available and would be happy to address this, address any Great. questions that you have. Yeah, look, I mean, we have we have 300 families we take care of. It's not 3,000. 
uh, and we're always interested in having conversations for, for clients who uh, haven't had a, a review set up yet for the beginning of the year. We're working our way through the list. Please reach out if you're interested in having one sooner rather than later. Uh, and uh, otherwise, we'll look forward to talking to you when we talk to you. And we'll be back again next week. So thanks, Pamela, for, for uh, moderating. And thanks, everyone, for joining. And hopefully it's useful. Uh, we look forward to speaking with you. Thanks, David.